and we are going live on Zoom. So hi everyone, thank you for coming and participating in um, a very experimental and first time uh, symposium on creative education in Havering. And we really appreciate your help in kind of directing young people in the area in what careers they might be able to take and also giving some comfort in you know, creative careers actually being something that you might want to partake in in the future. Um, the background of this event, Kirsty and Lisa were discovering that students locally weren't really that engaged in taking creative subjects because um, COVID-19 has kind of shown this disruption that we have in kind of payment in the creative industries, the freelance sector, and all of these other difficulties. And we all felt very passionately about the fact that the creative industries is one of the most important out of all of them, despite what newspapers say. And um, hopefully you all agree, and that's why you're here, that actually the creative industry is something that is still very necessary. And if not so more necessary now than it has been previously. For the benefit of the people watching on YouTube or not aware of um, the background of Compose, we have some amazing local creative people, people that have lived and worked locally in Havering um, or been educated in Havering here today to talk to you about their creative practice, how they've gone into the very different um, creative um, industries that they represent and also they're going to be answering questions that you might have concerns about or that your parents might have concerns about. Um, so what we're going to do to start with, we're going to kind of go around the group and just ask everyone who they are, where they come from and kind of why they're here today. So if I could first pass over to Lisa, who is, um, one of the organisers of this event um, to start us off. Hi, um, hi everyone. Um, my name's Lisa Walker. Um, I have lived in Havering um, all my life. Um, I went to school here and uh, studied my degree at Havering College um, and I work in Havering as well so I've kind of had a whole journey of uh, uh, art education and working in Havering which is really really good. Um, I am a curator at the Appleby Gallery, which is a gallery which is based in Francis Bartholdi Academy for Girls. Um, in 2006, they did a purpose-built gallery. Um, that's now moved actually into the main school, um, which is a lovely old original um, art room actually now. It's been converted into a, a gallery, which is lovely. Um, you can have a look at everything that we've got on show um, from our website. You can access that through the main Francis Barsley website. Um, yeah, we have a broad range of exhibitions, trying to keep it sort of uh, kid friendly with the girls that we they come they're allowed to come in and have a look at the exhibitions we like to try and keep it um good for the local community as well so we like working with local artists and um, we also have like many professional uh, shows as well which are coming in from um the haywood touring exhibitions and that sort of thing from the london college of fashion so real sort of broad range of exhibitions that we've got um, we've got some plans coming up for this year. It's been difficult with COVID because obviously we haven't been allowed to have um, members of the public in. So we've had to go uh, digital. So I've learned lots of new skills this year to try and keep it viable um, and keep the gallery open and running. Um, so yeah, really trying to push my knowledge of everything this year. Um, yeah, that's about it. Is that okay, Natalie? That's great. Thank you, Lisa. And moving on to Kirsty. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Kirsty. Um, just a bit, brief bit of background is I studied in Havering uh, up until uh, degree level um, studying fine art. Um, and then when I came back more to this area, I was always 
trying to take part in different uh, artistic schemes or work programs or um, and working collaboratively with um, different artists in the area. For me, I particularly like that element to, to everything. It's nice to share things. Um, and uh, I currently work as a, well, I've been there for about 10 years now, um, as an art technician in a leading London school, um, which is quite a forward thinking department. Um, and it's very, uh, it's just given me, being in a technician role, it's given me uh, lots of practice to try different techniques um, and also to be able to pursue my own um, interests um, outside of work without too much heavy commitment from my sort of day job. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's me. <laughs> Thanks, Kirsty. And if we could move over to Rhiannon. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Rhiannon Faith. I am a artistic director and choreographer of Rhiannon Faith Company, uh, which is based at Harlow Playhouse in Essex. Um, I kind of came up artistically in Romford. Um, I spent um, a good 11 years there I think um, with some you know wonderful artists and there's a really um, exciting and creative scene there and um, my work I think uh, a good memory of mine is uh, being at the steakhouse uh, in Romford the old steakhouse and putting on a, a big dance theatre visual art live art um, crazy extravaganza <laughs> um, in that steakhouse with live musicians um, yeah I kind of I make dance theatre uh, my most recent work uh, Drown Town um, will be um, streamed through the Barbican this year and I just as an artist like to make work that kind of talks about social injustice and that can potentially make a change um, and yeah, has something transformative for the people involved, but also for audiences that are able to access it. So yeah, that's, that's a bit about me. <laughs> Lovely to be here. That's great, thank you. Um, we could move over to Bobby. Hey there. Um, yeah, my name is Bobby Sayers. Uh, I'm an artist and curator. Uh, I'm currently in Rotterdam right now. But I grew up in Romford, I studied uh, in Brentwood, and I also studied in Haven College. Uh, I also worked for a while in uh, Francis Barsley, so the nice connections and it was really, uh, yeah, part of this uh, steakhouse project. Not that exact element, but it was really great, a good memory. I got some good memories from that as well. Um, yeah, for me, I've kind of... Um, moved about a bit, been in Glasgow and stuff, doing different projects, um, working. Uh, my work is like mainly sculptural and performance based. I work a lot in uh, the public, um, in public space and kind of, yeah, I'm also interested in the social aspect for me, particularly about like uh, how we value uh, ourselves or different people around us and the work that goes on. Um, so a lot of my work has, has been about work. Um, yeah, so, um, I have to say that's a lot. <laughs> cool, thank you. Um, if I could ask Georgia, would you be able to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Georgia Trower. Um, I grew up in Havering. I actually went to Francis Barsley and then I went to Havering in sixth form. Um, then went on to study architecture at university. So I'm a newly qualified architect and I'm working at a practice called BDP um, in the heritage sector on a large public project. But um, it's quite different to what I was doing at uni where we were studying the monsoon in, in Bangladesh and in India. So I've been able to work on a few varying different things as a creative, so as well as like stuff that I do on the side, which is competitions and things for local authority. So it's a real broad experience that I, I've got. That's great, thank you. And if I could ask Grace to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Grace. I have recently graduated from university. I've lived and I was born in Haverham. 
Um, I've lived there all my life. Um, I graduated last year. I went to Liverpool for my degree. Um, I had studied media and film. Um, then I came back to Haverham for my teacher training and I'm currently um, trained to be a teacher at Francis Bardsley um, and I'm currently teaching media um, and religious studies. Hannah? Hey guys, I'm Hannah. I have ideas, build sets and make photos. Um, went Francis Barsley, went our degree, uh, did four years uni at Westminster in photography. Um, I've worked as freelance photographer. I've done photo shoot, at, like photo booth at parties. I've done, oh, there's, I've photographed lots of things from products to commercial, to people, to weddings. Um, and now I kind of creative consult with businesses or well, that's kind of at the beginning of being a creative consultant for businesses. Um, you know, social media, TikTok. Um, I have lots of people kind of, I wouldn't say applaud me for creativity, like being limited in COVID has really kind of um, made me kind of reinvent what it is that I do and kind of how the value of my creativity has kind of almost like escalated over becoming a photographer now which is crazy but we're all all on a journey aren't we so I'm forever changing and this is where I am now <laughs> awesome thank you and last but not least um Reese, if I could ask you um what your background is yeah, sure. So, uh, so I live just outside Brentwood. I went to Brentwood County High School and I studied uh, product design at A-level. And then after that, I went on to do a digital marketing apprenticeship uh, in London. And now I am a clients and marketing executive for a consultancy firm. But a lot of my roles previously have sort of been a lot around sort of social media, uh, graphic design, uh, product design, product marketing, and uh, yeah, what are all those lines. That's great, thank you. And also, just to introduce myself, because I haven't done that yet, um, I'm Natalie. I currently have a couple of things that I do. So I'm the Deputy Centre Manager of uh, the Mercury Shopping Centre in Romford, which doesn't sound that much like a creative career, but I assure you it is. And also I run a group called the No Collective. Um, my background is in fine art. So I studied at Brentwood County High School as well. Um, I did an art A-level, a sociology A-level as well. Um, and also geography A-level. I think all three of them probably uh, set me up for the career that I have now. Um, I did a foundation course at Havering College. Um, and then I, I studied BA fine art at Chelsea College of Art but actually um, I mainly studied facilitation and performance art which again is very different to what I do now a bit like uh, some of the other people that have spoken I've had lots of different jobs um, from being a postwoman to delivering leaflets to um, cultural regen um, to now working in a shopping centre and actually what I'm doing now is probably one of the more creative jobs that I've had even in comparison to some of the creative industries working in galleries and stuff like that. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask some... Sorry, Natalie, did we introduce Majida? Ah, no, we didn't. I'm really sorry, Maj. Oh, so Thanks, I'm Lisa. I'm waiting for my other half who is um, trying to join us but having technical difficulties. My, my business partner, Lisa, is going to join us very soon. Um, we're not from Havering. We both grew up in North London. And our business was based in central and north London for quite a long time. But we've been in Havering for about a decade now. And we are very much trying to be part of the Havering art scene. And um, we studied fashion and art degrees. I was at London College of Fashion and Lisa studied at Shepparton in north London. Thank you, Madge. And very sorry. I, I was waiting for Lisa to come in on the call and then totally overlooked you at the end. Definitely my fault. Um, so now we're going to go on to some questions um, and these are going to be more specific questions for now and 
if you don't feel comfortable answering the questions, uh, just say pass as if we're in a game show and that is absolutely fine. Um, and also if there's any um, other members of the symposium that has kind of a leading question from that, please feel free to um, ask anything specific. Um, so the first questions I'm going to ask are gonna be directed towards Grace. So apologies for um, putting you up there first. Um, so great. <laughs> so Grace, um, can I ask, what is your biggest fear about becoming a teacher? This is going to sound really shallow, but building relationships. Um, being a teacher, I'm sure, you know, everyone kind of on the call and everyone watching understands that being a good teacher, you have to have that really good relationship with your students. I think that's half the battle sometimes. Um, so for me, my biggest fear was not getting that relationship. Um, but luckily, I've, you know, had an amazing experience so far. Um, and I just, yeah, it was a fear at first, but it's a fear that I've now combated, which is nice. Oh, that's really nice. Um, and Grace, you had a second question as well. So could I ask you, when did you decide that you wanted to go into teaching? And in addition to the subject you teach, what sorts of skills are needed to be a teacher? Do you feel that being a creative helps you to be a better teacher? And if so, what ways? Sorry, but let me let me That's all right. Um, so I've always wanted to be a teacher. I'm, I'm an extrovert. Um, Lisa and Hannah have, was involved in kind of like my education. They're going to know that I never stop talking. Um, so I've always been an extrovert. And I think mainly the main reason I wanted to be a teacher was through the amazing relationship I had with my teachers. Um, my teachers were a massive support, especially during my A-levels. Um, you know, I really struggled. I'm not the best academic person in the world. Um, so having my own teachers really kind of in, it sounds so cringy but impact my life kind of made me want to do the same um and then going on to the second bit to become a teacher the skills I needed was to be adaptable obviously I have trained to be a teacher in the craziest year ever um and you know it's being adaptable and be able to use resources effectively um because that enables you ultimately to kind of deliver you know a really engaging and you know pedagogy field lesson um I've done an A-level in photography um and that really helps me even now, just silly things like composition and um, you know, the eye of the way you look at things is definitely kind of, you don't think that having a photography A-level is going to help you make a PowerPoint about um, Islam, but it does because, you know, you, you have that eye of, of the way you're going to place things. Um, and also having the skills that I've gained, I've been able to kind of help the wider school community. So um, when we come back from the lockdown over Christmas um, I with one of our um, vice principals I created a video of ex-students kind of thanking teachers for what they do and saying kind of you know what you're doing is amazing and don't listen to the press um, and it was only like a really quick video um, but it's it, I got really good response from it and the only way I was able to make that video was because I have the skills that I learned through my creative studies um, and then being creative really helps me kind of be a better teacher linking it again sorry to covid and lockdown um but you know we got sh shoved into a lockdown and we had to kind of make our lessons more punchy because we our lesson times were cut down um make the task more engaging but still creative so having you know my creative background and having the skills that i gained during my creative studies helped me to you know adapt my teaching in a way that i never thought i would had have to do you know how do you split an hour lesson into 20 minutes um but yeah I hope that answers all of that that massive question <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's great thank you yeah no you were very concise um so if I could move on to we have a question for Rhiannon um which is is very based on dance really do you have to be a really good dancer to be involved with choreography and creative direction oh um <laughs> and I'd, I'd say that everybody has the potential to be a good dancer um, and I'd say that it's it's really to do with um, vision and and what you want to put out there and then I guess the, you, you use bodies in whatever way you can to achieve that vision I guess that's where I start I don't see myself as the best dancer but that's why I employ lots of really brilliant dancers to, to work with me, but I definitely um, have very strong concepts and visions. And um, I feel like working with them, you know, dancers that are, are very proficient that we can together collaborate to, to kind of search for, 
for the the concepts that we want to find together. Um, so I think you just have to have a passion for it. That's what I would say. And a belief in yourself that, um, you know, that's how you want to communicate your creativity. Um, I The way I think about dance is like, um, you kind of move your body like you're having a conversation with a friend and the friend is the audience. And, you know, that's what I ask my dancers to, to think about and to do. And so, yeah, I would say sometimes, um, you know, if you maybe don't think of yourself as the best dancer, whatever the best is, um, you know, it, it lends it's, it lends you and yourself to some kind of, um, you know, difference, idiosyncrasy, we call it. Um, and sometimes that's far more unique. I often hire dancers for their um, uniqueness um, and for their attitude and who they are as people rather than how high they can kick their legs. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, be different, stand out, understand your body, know what your, your body can do um, and what your limits are um, and, and yeah, just have faith in yourself. Oh, that's really lovely. Thank you. Um, I've just noticed this, that Lisa is in the room. Um, so I have a question for Brennan and Birch. How did you take your first steps into the fashion industry? Were you scared to get things made with your designs on? would help if I unmuted wouldn't it um it started off um we were at school together um uh we lived near Camden Town so it was very fashion conscious in them days in the 80s and um we were really into fashion at the time and I also I loved to draw and as we got older we wanted to go into something together that we was quite passionate about so um the idea was that Madge did pattern cutting and I did all the designs and the illustrations on the clothes. And it was a bit scary to be truthful, but um, it was more exciting for what lay ahead. And um, we was up for the challenge, but yeah, it was, um, it's a scary time to start thinking about doing any sort of business together, especially a creative business, because you don't know where that's gonna, that's gonna end. But um, I don't know what Madge, what, what do you think about the start yeah. when we did fashion? I mean before we started putting our own stuff, like we, we learned a lot of things on the go. So we, we did print this as things originally as screen printing, but we learned all the bits as we went. So it didn't seem scary because we just learned little bits as we went along, didn't we? Kind of taught ourselves what we needed to learn. Cool. Um, <laughs> cool. I'm going to move on to Bobby. If he's back, I saw that he ran off with his cat earlier. Um, Bobby, how did you get to work in different countries? Uh, first of all, I thought it might be useful to say that I um, studied at Nottingham Trent, a BA, and then I um, went on to do a Masters of Fine Art in Rotterdam at a place called Pietzvart Institute, just so that people, if they're interested in going on to these next stages, can kind of understand what those things are. Um, yeah, in different countries. So. Well, first of all, I, I mean, there's always a big, there's a big personal story. Could involve love, could involve heartbreak. Let's not go into the details. Um, but so I ended up with making some good friends. But the, the most important thing was that I kind of invested in myself. And I thought like that what I was doing, I could, I should stick with it. Because there was a point where I thought it was quite tough and maybe I should, you know, kind of stop what I'm doing. And I thought, no, I'm going to invest. And I, I kind of paid 300 euros, uh, 300 pounds um, to, to be part of a residency, which was in Czech Republic. And like, because of that residency, I met such an amazing community of people. And a lot of those people lived in Glasgow. And then when I was trying to decide what to do next, uh, they said, why don't you come live in Glasgow with us? And like, we can sort of do projects together and like do exciting things. So yeah, that kind of, deciding to take that, book that work off um, and like pay that money and do that opportunity, uh, even though it cost me rather than an opportunity that would give me money. Um, it was super worth it. And yeah, finding a good community is key. 
and then that went on to sort of making a decision that I, I really wanted to sort of uh, focus a bit more on, on the artworks that I was doing and and there was a particular masters that seemed right so I then went and did that in Rotterdam and also went on to make some really good friends and kind of carry on doing projects here. Great, thank you. Um, Georgia, do you get to be a creative every day as an architect? Um, it really depends on where you personally define creative to start and stop for you. So in architecture, there's concept design where you get you can engage a lot with communities and think of some really exciting ideas. But there's a lot of creativity when it comes to looking at technical details and drawing through, through those solutions. So yes, ultimately there's a lot of problem solving in, in architecture um, and coming up with spatial solutions, but it comes down to being able to articulate and show your ideas um, in a, either in a written or a visual way for people to understand and potentially get excited about. So. It, it really is down, it's down to what you find exciting. I'm currently working with like big data um, at a master plan level. And I find it really engaging that I'm trying to find a way of representing that data in a way that is legible. Um, so it, it can create some really like exciting images, but it's not necessarily design, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're not you're not painting every day. But not painting and drawing all the time, yeah. but yeah. Lots of creative thinking. Yes. Cool. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move over to Rhys. Um, you're not technically in um, what you would configure as like a creative industry as standard. Yeah. Um, so where do you find creative inspiration when you're at work? Um, so to explain it fully, so my creative side was really brought out, you know, in my sort of product design and I really wanted to get into sort of graphic design and into marketing. So that's sort of the avenue that, that I took. Uh, and then I've worked for a few firms since then. So I worked at a, uh, a technology firm uh, with product marketing. So they're sort of my creative inspiration. We were designing a product for uh, a retail environment. So my sort of creative edge was coming in in sort of the branding aspect of it. So the people that I was working with were, you know, quite senior people in the company, but they, they had never, they didn't have that creative flair um, for, uh, you know, to help create a successful branding campaign. Uh, and then sort of I moved into more sort of the corporate side uh, into sort of infrastructure and now I'm in consulting, but that creativity still uh, is an underlying thing, especially with a lot of social media campaigns that I do. So, I mean, my creative inspiration, I, I would say, is probably with like the, the design teams within my, uh, my firm. So because I've had that background knowledge of, uh, of creativity and design we sort of gel quite well and can bounce ideas off each other and it just creates that communication is is so much easier uh, especially when you when you have that foundation knowledge so yeah my inspiration would, is comes from the people who you know the graphic designers within my firm that then I can work with to uh, use them to the most sort of the effective way to create a good good marketing campaign cool and um and what kind of skills do you need for the role you're doing now? Um, what, what would you say, uh, like the, the biggest skills that you use on a day to day basis? Um, you need to, most importantly, it's sort of knowing your audience and breaking down what your marketing campaign and what your creativity, what you're designing, who that's tailoring to. So that then you can use that to, um, you know, so you you know you're you're meeting your your target audience. So I would say that's probably one of the biggest uh, the biggest skills that you need to have, along with obviously having that that creative eye and knowing what you know what actually looks good on paper and what's going to engage people. Because at, at the end of the day, if you if you don't engage your audience, then yeah, it, it's not successful. So you just need to inspire people and create that interest really. And you did an apprenticeship. So a, a lot of people in the call 
obviously went through um, degree routes and education routes and stuff like that. What, what did you find with the pros and cons of doing an apprenticeship? To be honest, I, you know, I'm yet to find any, any cons. I mean, it, it dep- obviously depends on your, uh, who your apprenticeship company. So obviously I went through an apprenticeship company for those that don't know. Uh, I think it was called Arch Apprentices at the time, but I think they've now changed to Avado, uh, based in London. Uh, but obviously with that, you you interview with them as, a, and, you know, you show that you want to be in marketing or whatever the apprenticeship is in, and they place you with um, a firm. So a lot of it depends on what firm you get placed with. And luckily, I, I, you know, I got placed with, with a good firm. Uh, and then, you know, get, getting into that and having that sort of, uh, when you meet Rand, you know you meet people uh, you meet people that from all sort of walks of life and I think the thing that made me take that over a university is first of all I, I, I couldn't actually finish my A-levels I, 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 I was I knew what I wanted to do I knew that I wanted to be in marketing and I found that at, with A-levels you had to really um you couldn't tailor it to what I wanted to do. So I had to take subjects that I didn't really have as much of an interest in. Uh, sort of, yeah, I did, I did maths, I did history to try and get around. All I wanted to do was product design and marketing, but that wasn't somewhere that I could go. Uh, so that's why I sort of, I finished my product design AS level and then went off to do the digital marketing course because that's what I wanted to specialize in. Um, but yeah, um, and obviously you get paid to do it which is you know obviously that's not the, the primary thing is is that you're there to learn and improve yourself but to get paid is, is is an added bonus you don't have that you know you don't you know you're not you're not paying for your education you you know you're getting paid for it so that that was also uh you know a big perk and as, i mean i don't think anything beats experience you know in all of the roles that i've interviewed for and gone on for i've never been held back from without going out down that degree route so I think it really depends you know what you want to do if, if what you want to do is is a practical subject and something that you know that you can uh you know actually get out there and get some experience and go and do then that apprenticeship is, is a great great way I mean if anyone wants if anyone listening that wants to know more about apprenticeships I think on the no collective website it's my LinkedIn so you can just give me a message you know, and I can point you to, you know in the in the direction of apprenticeship companies that I've worked with and people that I've met in the past that yeah would be a good help that's really kind offer thank you um yeah I, I think there's a couple of different social medias on there as well so feel free to have a look on the website click through to see what everyone's doing and if there's contact to be made I'm sure people won't mind uh, giving support where they can um I'm going to ask Hannah a couple of questions so there's one technical question, Hannah, and then one that is more about um, like you personally. So the first question is, when did you first know that you wanted to become a photographer and who would you say encouraged you the most? <laughs> well, it's funny. Now I don't want to be a photographer. <laughs> um, so I think I... I... So I studied art GCSE and in that time I then kind of stopped drawing and picked up my camera. So it's been about 10, 10 years now of using photography as a tool. And for all that time, I thought I'm going to be a photographer. Like that is what I'm going to do. So 10 years ago, I thought I was going to be a photographer. And the past year I've realised I don't want to be a photographer. <laughs> and I think the, I think the, the core to what everyone's saying here is that there's no right way to do what what you think you're going to be doing so creativity is so organic and you can't constrict it um but training as a photographer and doing a photography degree means that I have the skills to take what's in this chaotic brain and all these crazy ideas and get them out into the world for other people to see and to relate to. Um, that has what, that's what photography has really done to me is being able to take the vision, what um, Rihanna was saying, like take your vision and what it is that you really care about and be able to share it with the world. 
I think that is what the core of kind of creativity is. So in any kind of format you choose to study, whether that's music, dance, art, it's really just about understanding what it is that you want to say and using an art form to how to say it. And whether that's then going into marketing so that you're able to say, tell other people's stories. So that's like totally off the topic of the question, but I don't want to be a photographer anymore. <laughs> I don't want to just take photos for money. Um, I want to be able to use my creativity in other ways. And I feel like that label has kind of boxed me in for so long. But yeah, I, that, I'm, that's it, I'm done now. <laughs> I guess that's what this is about though, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's about, you know, to be a creative, you don't have to be defined as one thing. You can, you can have any career that you want. Um, yeah. Going to the, the very practical question though, <laughs> um, what types of photography careers are there out there? Because you obviously know that you don't want to be a photographer now. So yeah. you must have had lots of different photography jobs. Yeah. I, I just imagine anything that you see a photo of, you can be that photographer. Like um, from the stuff in shops to the, uh, even to the TV ads, there's photos of everything and they use photos so widely. Um, I mean baby like just anything if people want memories companies what Bobby's laughing at me I don't know how to any <laughs> anything that you can see a photo of you can be the photographer of that I think it's just about knowing what it is that really gets you energized to take photos of it is that is that good enough <laughs> I will let you go I will let you go um <laughs> Our last person to ask questions to is James, but we're just waiting for him to come into the call. So we're just going to move on to some of the symposium questions. And the first question I'm going to ask is, what is the best avenue to get your work seen by the most number of people? So if I could ask um, a couple of people to respond to this, um, I'm, I'm thinking, Hannah, actually, now you've chosen this new career path. Um, and also, Rhiannon, you obviously have an amazing um, experience in, in getting your work out there. I mean, you've been working with some huge national companies. Um, and also, Majin and Lisa, I know that you've been working on more um, presentation style works after your product design. So perhaps you would be able to talk us through your individual cases. Yeah, sure. Hannah, do you want to go first? <laughs> um, social media is such a powerful tool. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, and back to what Rianne was saying, that the more kind of unique you are and the more that you put what it is that you love and not what the ideal of good and perfect is, is the more people will kind of, the more traction you'll get with the people that get you. Um, so don't try and copy what the person with the million views is doing really just put out there what what it is that makes you you and since I've been doing that through kind of COVID and lockdown um, I've now been getting jobs kind of not even what I've been searching for but people come to me and go hey you've been doing this really cool stuff you want to teach a workshop hey you've, I see that you did the boat thing can you I don't know, can you do a workshop to 10 people? You know, like it's, it's just been a massive learning curve for me that now just putting out what it is that's like me is what it is that's paying me now um, instead of putting out what, every, what I thought was what people wanted to see, which was like a watered down version of myself. I used yeah. to... <laughs> I I'll chime in Hannah um, I totally agree it's I mean it takes quite a long time it's to do with confidence and it's also to do with just having time in your week um to to just figure out what your artistic voice is so um you know in marketing I'm sure there's the the USP that you hear about all the time but in kind of my world um like dance or theatre um, it's all about your artistic voice. And I think throughout my career from mentors, that was um, the phrase that was going on, find your artistic voice. 
And it's kind of like trying to find the whole the holy grail. Like <laughs> you're going on a search, going, what is it? I just don't know. But um, it's actually it's just you. <laughs> and that's the thing. It's just you, your identity, where you're from, what your narrative is. Um, and you know, thinking it's okay for that to be put out there and to not think that that's filled with ego or, you know, that it's selfish or, you know, any of those things. You just need to be confident that you as a person is cool and that you can put yourself out there and people will think that you're, you know, offering and contributing something to the world in some way. And I think as long as that's your intention, if that's what you're trying to do, you're trying to say, okay, I have this creativity. It's part of who I am. I don't actually know what else I would do. Um, then I think you just put it out there and people and people get it. I mean, like Hannah was saying, you can feel boxed in and maybe it's very easy for other people to put you in a box and put labels on you and what you do and who you should be and where you sit in the landscape of the genre that you're working within or around. And actually you can create your own box and that can be a mishmash of all different kinds of genres and identities. And as long as it's, you know, your honest story, then that's more special in a way. And it might take a bit longer to, build your audiences but they will grow with you and they will stick with you so I think of course visibility on social media I mean Hannah I might need to talk to you about TikTok because I don't have a clue <laughs> about that but um, I'm a bit um I think I've missed I'm a bit old for the being really good on social media so I have to get help with that from my team to be honest um but yeah be visible be true to who you are and just believe that Everyone in this world is creative. I think Grace and Perry's art club on the telly has proved that everyone is so creative. And if you can direct your creativity in a in a way that you can build your career around, that's a real special thing. But don't don't do it in anyone else's way. Do it in your way. I would say a couple of things. Thanks, Rhiannon. Um, Around press, so if you are asked to feature in press, always respond really quickly, always have good images ready, always have a bio ready, and just respond very quickly to press because there's lots of opportunities through being seen by lots of people. And also exhibitions. We did a lot of trade fairs and we've also done quite a few retail fairs and putting yourself out there in front of lots of people, um, that's a really good way to pick up contacts. You may not make necessarily massive sales at the exhibition, but again, you may get press through it. You may get other types of coverage. You'll get connections. You'll get other businesses coming up to you. So absolutely do consider getting out, not just online, but offline. Um, whether it be retail selling opportunities, pop-ups, just getting your work seen by lots of people in lots of different places. Lace, anything I've forgotten? Oh, can I just jump in? Because I'm going to have to shoot soon. Um, so if I just say, um, uh, diversify your portfolio as well. So if, for example, I have an audience coming to a theatre to watch a show, I can also offer that audience um, lots of merch after the show. And I can, um, I've become a published author. So just because I work in dance, it doesn't mean that your creativity can't go into different places and then I can have audiences that might enjoy reading plays or buying plays as well as going to the theatre to see live work. Um, so yeah, it's worth um, thinking where can your creativity stretch to, um, especially if you want to monetize on that creativity as well. Um, I'm gonna have to say good night to everyone, but it's uh, really lovely to see you and I hope that's helpful. And I just wanted to say to Grace before I went, um, congratulations on your teacher training and something that a teacher said to me once was um, in a dance class she says oh you have a natural flair for that and it was just that line she said to me that made me go oh I should work in dance then <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think teachers have such a power to um, to inspire creativity in young people and um, it could be just from something very simple um, that could take someone in a direction. I'm sure we've all got a version of that ourselves. Um, 
but yeah lovely to to spend the evening with you creative people thank you so much Rhiannon okay bye bye take care thank you so Lisa was there anything that you wanted to add to that or should we move on to you're on mute Lisa <laughs> <laughs> keep on doing uh, that yeah keep relationship with journalists that are interested in your kind of work keep it up and send them stuff and you might not get in the magazines all the time but we found it useful that we, we had relationships with certain journalists for years so um we spent quite a lot of time trying to get into um magazines and stuff and sometimes we weren't that lucky and, uh, and uh, now the Instagram, Facebook and all that, you can self promote yourself and get there. And like you said, it didn't really, sometimes we found it hard in magazines to show how quirky people we were. So it's nice to have the balance now that you can have both sides to it. But I'd say if you find someone really interested or interesting in you, always stay in touch if you can, if that's. Yeah, it's really good advice. Being nice to journalists is definitely not too nice, so that's corrupt. <laughs> how how do you get how do you get in the same room as a journalist? Like, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> you just butter them up by email or you know, on the telephone, or you know, just be complimentary. Because normally if you someone likes your stuff, you are naturally got a rapport, haven't you? So you, you you sort of like become quite friendly, but don't let that go, you know, try and keep that strand all the time because we went, like we said, went for fa from fashion to interiors and it was quite a difficult jump to make. But, you know, some people stayed with us and some people stayed, some journalists were still loved ourselves, was interested, but we kept the thread up all the time. So it's just a handy tip to, um, you know, you want to stay visible as much as you can. And it's really hard when you're small, so you've got to grab onto the bits that you can, you know. Sorry, I'm, I'm nodding rather than saying yeah, but I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, I have a, a question that is um, related to education, and I'm going to direct this towards Georgia and Grace as um, new graduates. Once I get to uni, what are good questions to put to my lectures to keep me on track? You know, how do you keep yourself um, kind of directed towards the end goal of your chosen career? you want to go Grace? <laughs> yeah I don't mind. Um, for me um, it's always just been really simple things like to-do lists, keeping on track of things. At uni your lecturers won't chase up on you and say you need to hand that essay in, it, it gets the deadline and if you've, had, if you've not handed it in you know it doesn't bother them. Um, so I would say you know just keep on track of things, have a diary, like really simple things, your, your calendar on your phone um, for keeping track but also in terms of careers chat to your careers team chat to your lecturers because they have had you know depending on how long they've been a lecturer for had you know hundreds thousands of graduates coming through their course where have ex-graduates ended up linkedin's amazing um i've gained all of my kind of work experience and insights into careers through my teachers and through my lecturers um so i'll just say you know maybe if you're not confident you might not feel like you can but just send an email you know go up to them and say hey look I'm really interested in this have you got any tips do you know anyone in that industry um because I did to my photography teacher and I ended up um being able to like go to London Fashion Week and you know all these little things is, is amazing so I would just say put yourself out there and kind of ask the questions yeah I'd kind of I would echo that as well I would say if you're struggling with something don't don't avoid your lecturers. Don't hide away from them. They're there to help you. If you've not done what you need to do or you're worried about, you don't get told off as such, but just don't just suffer on your own. Um, just just speak up and just try and come to a resolution either with your classmates or your lecturers or teachers and stuff. So, yeah, they're there, they're there to help you. So speak up. Can I say uh one thing yeah, um, sure. so about about your end goal i would say that when you go through uni don't be so like blinkered and be open to learning new things experiencing 
you know, just experience all the things you can do because the people that you meet in all those different places will most likely be able to help you up, you know, four years down the line. And don't be like, oh, I can't do that because that doesn't mean I'll be a photographer. Like, you just, you'll never know. And, you know, don't just enjoy it. Um, yeah, I didn't do that enough. Just enjoy it. <laughs> enjoy the process. Definitely. When you're 10 years out of university, you will really regret not enjoying it enough. Um, Bobby, I have um, this, this question that you wanted me to ask you, and I'm going to invite Hannah into this as well. And Lisa and Madge will probably also enjoy the, this question. Is it true that there's no money in the arts? <laughs> that was a good question. Um, and I wanted to answer it in the most annoying way. That's how I thought I'd answer it. Is that, um, <clears throat> like, for me, the biggest thing about the arts is that you can really do something that... Um, uh, someone mentioned Grace and Perry's Art Club. Like, this is something that truly feels so good to do and like that you feel so passionate about and that you're connecting with the people that you love to be around and you just wake up and you feel like energized by it um and and it has that flexibility to let you yeah like I don't feel restricted to just being an artist like yeah I do feel like you know I can make books I can yeah do different things like if I want to do that um so, so yeah money like for me um, it's always been enough that I need, you know, uh, to, to, to feel uh, good about the way I live, uh, to live well, shall we say. And yeah, and some of, other creative roles have more money than others. So definitely, yeah, you can definitely earn enough money. That is what I'd say. Like, it's not, it's not, like, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It can be like, um, not always as easy and not always like consistent depending on what role you went. I'm, I'm an artist. So for me, I, a lot of, I do a lot of independent projects and yeah, there's, so it can be up and down, but you know, you can't really put, you're talking about money and then it's like, yeah, like I want to be happy, you know? So anyway, yeah, that's where I went with that one. I, uh, I agree. I think um, one of the, the facts that I've learned about in the last I don't know, three months is how oh God, I'm going to go into robots here. So AI and, you know, all these kind of like new technology that's automating processes like packaging and, um, you know, even to like self checkouts and like manual labor is just like plummeting in the world. Um, but the things that robots cannot replicate is your original unique ideas you know taking taking one thing and another thing and putting it together to make something new um from the vaccine that's now doing covid to um to the person that thought of firing glass to make glasses like everything you see around you is down to creativity and humans and that is only going to go up in the world in the next five years because of all the technology we do have um, so studying art now, studying photography now, and being able to take ideas and concepts and put them out into the world is only going to be even more valued within the next five years. So when you enter your, uh, I was going to say, when you enter your industry, like when you graduate and you become an adult and you're looking for a job, creativity is going to be up there. And if you have the courage to pursue it, because creativity is hard, you know, you do you encounter fear and uh, like Bobby was saying like sometimes there's no right answers but if you can keep going and push past that you are going to be one of the most valuable assets in this world and I just don't give up on it and you you will talk to the people that are in their 60s and their their soul is sad because they had to stop doing what they love to earn money and the grind and you, when I'm, I'm out in the world a lot building stuff and they come up to me and they just like, you see the light back in their eyes because they're like, I get it. Like, this is what I used to love to do. And they're just so like team Hannah <laughs> because like they just see 
this kind of raw creativity out in the world where really is a place creativity just get beaten down so much um so that's that was my ted talk for today <laughs> creativity is gonna rule the world and even though it's scary and sometimes you have no idea what to do just stick with it knowing that it's your passion and it'll work out in the end yeah um, and adding to that i mean with art you know depends how you define art like there isn't there may not be money in the first thing you try you know it might be that you might study one type of art but actually you end up doing product design or graphic design or something else which turns out to be the thing that makes you money so um, as other people have said being willing to diversify find out what people want and be driven by the people that are buying whatever it is that you do and not being too precious to adapt what you're doing or to change um, to go where the money is and and you might have to not change who you are but maybe look at different products and different avenues to make money out of art is there anything that you wanted to add later or i was basically going to say almost the same thing as badge <laughs> dude, so. <laughs> yeah i agree totally yeah diversify is quite important um if something's not working don't be afraid to apply your original um, creativity onto something else. Don't be scared of it because like, like um, something might not make the money first of all, but there's a, there is a place for everybody and there is a, a piece of pie for everybody. You just got to find out like the place where you fit and where you're going to earn your money. It might take a long time. We've been doing it for over 20 years. We're not rich, but we're happy and we're, we, you know, we're loving what we do and, um, it's our lives so you can make money out of it some people become very very rich out of it some people become comfortably okay and some people just scrap but they're still loving it you know they wouldn't change it for the world so um yeah oh, thank you <laughs>
but to have that extra knowledge I, in the company I work for currently I actually went to a museum and saw that they were doing a proposal for this museum and I took that to my interview to say I saw what you were doing here and that's why I want to work here so I'd just yeah just don't don't hold back and just go go for it the worst they can say is no it's amazing that that actually happened as well that <laughs> you you saw them like them and then got the job there that's really cool can I add something to that Natalie yeah of course Lisa oh yeah just echoing what George just said there um I think that researching your company if you've got this company that you want to work for do your research on them and look at their website um follow their twitter look at their linkedins find out about them and get as much information as you can and just like georgia did she actually went to one of their exhibitions and then she could take that when she actually got on an interview um so that's yeah that's my bit of advice from a photography portfolio perspective if you make work that's kind of mirrors their style already um so they they can see that you get the brand look that often um, gives you a level up over all the other portfolios they may receive. So if you if the, you have a dream company, just kind of work in their style and mirror their brand. Um, and you should, if not get them as a client, you'll be able to get people that are like them as like a, almost like a stepping stone, um, which is uh, what I've seen, what I've done and what many other people do. Yeah, that, that is that is really true. I, I, I've had an experience before. I went for um, an interview for a, for a company uh, and I did loads of research and I had one of the tasks in my interview um, was I had to, uh, you know, create a social media plan for their uh, a particular product for the next sort of few months. So I, I not only did I do that, I sort of had a look on their website. I saw their branding and I made the PowerPoint template in their brand colours and uh, you know, I I saw that they had their their own podcast, so I mentioned I dropped in there that oh from you know from episode whatever of your podcast, just bringing this idea, and it's sort of, you know I didn't actually get the role. However, one of the people on the you know on the management board that was in the interview actually emailed me uh, like about a year later and said, I remember you from this interview. I really liked what you did in that interview. You know, are you open for an opportunity? So, yeah never you know you never know who's listening and how you know how that might help you down the line so research is is very good i would also add to always be always have your port spend time on your portfolio or whatever your output is and try not to go in with realms of unorganized work like be tailor tailor it to the job that you're applying for um at uh, an appropriate size as well. I know a lot of people could go into architecture interviews with massive A2 portfolios, and it's just you're sitting at a table in a more corporate setting. It's it's very messy, a bit complicated, um, and it would get you in a bit of a state <laughs> trying to navigate all that stuff. And given it from a school's perspective as well, have a look at their Ofsted reports, look at what the school's working on, because showing how you can help the school improve and where you, you see yourself in the school, you can say, you know, you have a um, an attainment gap in year nine boys, I could really help, you know, you achieve this target by our next Ofsted report by doing this and kind of having that background knowledge does make you shine through and it makes after the interview it makes me go oh, do you remember you know you know Georgia had that really good point and it, it, it makes you memorable which I think is half the battle with when you're being interviewed it's really interesting like all of different perspectives I think research is key isn't it just knowing what you're applying for um it kind of moves us on nicely to the next question which is how to pitch your work um I think this is this is probably one for the freelancers so uh, Bobby again, Lisa and Lisa and Madge, um, Lisa and Hannah, and also Kirsty. You know, you're in a situation where you're you're pitching for work constantly. What do you think is the kind of your go-to technique for that? Um, I'll just. I mean, I I've only just started doing this really, so it'll be 
very interested to listen to what everyone else has got to say about it. Um, Because Charlotte and I, we just started Bluer Skies um, Creatives and it's sort of to have like a mindfulness uh, at the heart of anything that we do creatively. Um, And we recently scored some funding, um, which is great because it's our first thing. Um, But uh, that was through really sort of people um, for people that we know um and uh, but as for going forward though i would yeah love to hear what other people have got to say about that maybe i'll i'll just say like like some of the things i find when going for opportunities or or it could be like funding like i don't like or in working with institutions and and finding what opportunities that they have is like um often I do this thing where I see something that sounds like an exciting opportunity and then I'm like I get super excited I come up with some crazy idea and then I realize like they're telling me it's like to make I don't know a film in a certain way and I'm like I'm not really a filmmaker in that way or I'm not really a podcaster like I'm not really going to get this opportunity so but then there's loads of opportunities you know and then I find one about doing performance or uh, making a sculpture and, and then I realized like, oh, actually, you know, sometimes it's about conserving your energy because you don't want to be applying all the time. Like, otherwise you just work in admin job. Um, but like, so being a bit smart about what you apply for, like kind of like really looking around before you go straight for a fund or for a, a particular opportunity. Um, yeah, it's something that I would say is quite useful. I think also back to what other people were saying, um, doing as much research as you can on the person you're going to pitch to. So making sure that you reassess whatever pitch you have already prepared and look at making it appealing to that person, referring to things they've done, um, bringing in things in their style, yes, but also just um, updating your pitch every time you need to deliver it. So having something fairly simple, like a PowerPoint set of slides, and then you may be adding things that are relevant to the person, but just having a, a starting point but not saying the same thing to everybody because otherwise you won't appeal to them. You do really need to personalize whatever it is you're doing. I, um, to jump in, uh, just received 3000 pound workshop funding from Haven Changing. Um, and I think what's maybe what come through the most is like my passion for what I do. And then kind of like addressing maybe like the bigger situation of how, so like in in businesses you like you you solve a problem so I kind of in my pitch I addressed the problem and then I said how I was gonna solve it and then what makes my solution better and then demonstrating that with words but also like really clear visual imagery that backs that up um and that kind of goes with introducing yourself to a company to do product photography going hey I'm Hannah I see you haven't got any photos or models. This is a true story. This is what I do. Um, and then I was at a business, um, uh, what's they called, trade shows. So instead of going through like walls of emails and that kind of untangible connection, I put myself in these places that I knew I was going to find clients and made sure that when I was there, I knew doing the research, I knew exactly what it was that, I needed to say to them to get the attention and then back that up with photos on an iPad. Um, so yeah, research um, and what Bobby was saying, just make sure that you're not spreading yourself too thin, really identify what it is that you want your client to be and then get in the right place at the right time, um, which real life events was a lot nicer than sitting behind a computer for hours for me, but haven't been able to do that for a year. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that's what I used to do. I used to go to trade shows to do commercial photography and get new clients there. Um, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, and I think also there's like a lot of great, like younger opportunities for young creatives and like and recent graduates, those sort of things. So like between like 15 and, and 25, there can be a lot of things or for emerging creatives if you're like not fit in an age group. And I, sometimes I see those opportunities with institutions that I would love to be work at and I'm like damn it I'm so old like you know so yeah. I think one of the things is actually making sure you just click send 
you know. Yeah. Otherwise, you ain't going to have no chance if you didn't send it. I think the other side is that um, once you do have your creative down, maybe once you graduate uni, see if you can um, study, get some free courses with like business, that just business talk, you know, how to market yourself, um, how to create a product of value, how to um, over deliver, you know, just like business so that you can deliver your value as a creative is really important and maybe not spoken about enough throughout my education. You guys actually have some loads of talks about business at the moment, don't you? Or you had, Natalie? We, we did have. Unfortunately, they finished today with an amazing uh, workshop from Bobby, just to shout him out. But, <laughs> but yeah, I think just, just to add to that networking aspect, anything that you don't learn at school, find your local artist community and learn from them. Um, you know, it, it's, especially if, if you're finding it difficult to get work or get funding, you know, there's people out there who have done that. And, you know, creatives are generally lovely people and they're always happy to help in whatever scenario you're in. Um, Just think you had for, um, as from the gallery's perspective, um, when I'm looking for artists to show in the gallery, um, I've got a a few remits that I have to kind of tick because obviously the gallery is in a school. So there's like, it's a unique space. It's not, I haven't got the flexibility that um, a gallery on the high street might have. Um, so um, I would say that most of the exhibitions that I have shown, we've taken from local communities and they've been like word of mouth um, through the friends of friends. Um, I've also found them from uh, something called Axis Arts. That's a database, an artist database. And you can go through there and you can kind of like look at different genres of uh, work. You can look at different medias. So that's quite a nice platform to get your name on if you really want to sort of be easily searchable through a, a wider um, artistic community. But again, the Yay Mates one as well, that's really nice to see the local artists um, because I really think that's quite important for us as a local gallery to work with the local community. Um, we've had past pupils as well. So I think that having an online presence, so when you're starting your degree and having your online presence is really important so that somebody like me could then go to your website, have a look at your work, have a look at your Instagram, um, have a look at your Twitter and just see what you're doing. Um, and yeah, because if you, if you don't have your website and you don't have that online platform, it's really difficult to sort of get a view of what, what you're making and what you're doing. Yeah. Something on that as well, following from what Lisa's saying, um, if you are not sure what you're going to brand yourself under, maybe have a website with your own name, because if you have a student website and then you have another website under something else, and then you have a Wix and then you have a this and you keep chopping and changing and you get your website published in places, people then can't find you. So if you're not quite sure how you're going to operate, maybe just use your own name for the time being and, and have something that you're going to be able to keep for a good few years. But if you start directing people to it and then you chop and change, you won't get the publicity that you would have done. And, and also, if you're an artist and you're showing a particular uh, style of work, um, what, we, what I look for is that you, you can have an exhibition, but then you have, might have an opportunity then to make money through the gallery by providing a workshop. So like if Hannah was to show her um, photography in the gallery, then we might bring her in and she might run uh, a day's um, workshop for the, for the girls, which we'll probably have to talk to you about, Han. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there is opportunities there to sort of show your work plus make money from it because showing the work in the gallery, we can't actually pay for because we're, we're not funded for that, but we can, we can fund workshops because then uh, you're bringing a skill to the girls, which the girls are then learning. Yeah. That's really useful, really useful tip to know as well. And to get that insight into kind of the background of how you, how you choose people and, you know, what kind of opportunities there are in different places as well. Um, I'm just going to introduce you to James, who has popped up. Um, James has very happily come straight after another Zoom meeting, where actually he's been helping artists find funding um, through Havering and Changing. 
James, could I ask you just to introduce yourself, kind of your educational background, uh, what you do now? And then we have a question for you, which I will ask you after you've um, kind of given us a rundown. Fab, thanks Natalie. So uh, my name is James Jackson. I am the project director for Havering Changing. Um, and um, Havering Changing is um, the new arts, arts and culture project called, um, that's a creative people in place, which is funded by the Arts Council. And we're about kind of four specific communities. So that's Harrow Hill, Romford, Raynham and Orchard Village, um, creating their own program of activities and events that are chosen by local people um, and a little bit about my my background so I went to school I grew up in Harold Hill um, and went to school in Dagnum so I went to All Saints Roman Catholic School in Dagnum um, and I suppose that my creative education really I mean creativity for me is the reason why I learn ultimately I, I kind of when I was um, but, you know, I couldn't read until I was about 10 or 11, you know, I kind of got an odd learning style. And the, the thing was that, you know, I, because I couldn't read, I couldn't learn anything because that was kind of the main teaching style at the time. And um, I loved story, though. I loved people telling stories. I loved being involved in plays. You know, I really, really got up on kind of storytelling and had, for the patients, the librarians and school teachers, knowing that I loved that, they kind of read to me and eventually I could learn and eventually I was able to learn lots because I could read. Um, and then I really kind of lacked in confidence, I think, because of this, this issue around reading, because I didn't do very well at school. And so because I lacked in confidence, I, I kind of, because I still loved storytelling, I'd done uh, drama at um, GCSE. And that just helped me so much with my confidence, you know, like kind of being in plays and performing kind of helped me to build confidence and to know how to communicate with people. And, and from that I kind of was like right I want to be a director I want to kind of you know I'd, I'd loved uh, theatre and I love film and I kind of want to learn how to make films so I've done media studies at A level at Warren School and then went to film school at the Cambridge School of Art which is Anglia Ruskin University and studied filmmaking for three years and I came out of university during the kind of like the big recession in 2008 and there was just no jobs there was absolutely no jobs anyway I found it really difficult I'd worked for my students union for a year running the communications department and the um the uh, school newspaper this university newspaper and really wanted to kind of get a job in the media but there just wasn't anything there was no entry-level jobs and I was like oh I don't know what I'm going to do and luckily I had kind of well I signed on for about 12 weeks and then they said you're going to have to go up to the next stage and I was like oh I really don't want to sign on anymore and I walked past Waterstones in Romford and they had jobs for kind of temporary booksellers and I was like oh I could work in Waterstones that seems like a nice kind of Christmas gig um, so I started working at Waterstones and yeah was there for about three months and just absolutely loved it just got it back into retail learned how to work full-time got a full-time job there and I think there's something in learning how to work full-time in retail there's something about doing a service job that kind of really develops your kind of people skills you know like that's the, the kind of key thing with any kind of work it doesn't matter what kind of job you do you need to learn how to work you need to learn how to work with line managers you know you need to learn how to work with the public so kind of do, doing a retail job or a catering job you know it's so important I think it's massive for my own development and from then I kind of I'd worked at Frankie and Benny's when I was um, was a student at university and I popped in one on a mother's day and a friend that I was working with, who was also a filmmaker there was like, oh, I might have a job for you. And he'd got me, he was basically working in a media studio, um, alternative education provider in Barking at the Barking foyer. They had a media, a digital media studio there and they'd done training courses for young people that had dropped out of school or were youth offenders or children in care. And it was kind of learning how to take um, photographs in a professional studio. There was like a big Mac suite. It's lots of media courses. And I kind of went in there as an admin and kind of progressed up as a, as a tutor teaching kind of photography and filmmaking and stuff like that. We just kind of made projects. We made films. We, you know, we done kind of developed websites. We, we run projects for libraries. And I realized that I kind of, I do want to be a filmmaker or wanted to be a filmmaker, but actually what I loved more was kind of, you know, working community, working with young people, you know, like that was the thing that really kind of that I enjoyed the most so from then worked for the youth service and then worked uh, went to work for libraries in Westminster and Kensington and yeah this time about was it some last year about a year ago kind of saw this job came up for you know a kind of community-led arts project and you know kind of helping to, to set that up and you know it's all going to be led by local people and it's about getting as many people involved in create creativity as possible and I'd kind of I'm big on Joseph Boyes who's a German artist um, and who said everyone is an artist and I, I believe in that more than anything everyone is creative everyone's an artist it's how we learn it's how we you know it's, it's how we 
adapt to any situation. We have to be creative to adapt. So I was kind of like, I want to go and get involved with this project and, and make this happen. It's in it's in Havering, it's in Harold Hill. It's where I've grown up. I want to kind of help other people to be creative. So so that's a, just kind of like a, a real kind of whirlwind kind of backstory of my kind of creative kind of journey and jobs. In terms of, so this is your question, in terms of um, your job now, how is being a creative program director different to a normal project director? And what would you say are the, the skills that you need most when doing that, that job? So, so it's an interesting one because I wouldn't consider myself a, a creative program director, you know, but because Havering Changing is about facilitating you know, local people to be the creative director. There's some other creative people in places, projects across the country where they do have creative directors and creative program and producers. And I think it's a really odd job to take that in a CPP because ultimately it's about local people in the community making the decision about their own creative program. You know, I, I see my role as kind of being a lot more kind of facilitative, really. And uh, but I kind of I, I saw this question on on the website and I, and I was thinking about well what is the difference between a, a kind of creative program director and a and a, a creator and a project director and they're, they're quite similar in some ways you know like I kind of kind of there's some key skills around kind of leadership and kind of you know developing a vision of you know, a community's vision and kind of empowering others to make that happen and setting a direction I think there's some things in in management about kind of you know bringing the best out in other people and coaching creating a, a great culture of work um, removing barriers that people have and developing your staff I think there's, you know, there's always going to be managing the finances and budgeting and fundraising, um, working with stakeholders. I think all of those things, you know, if you become a, a director level job, whether you're a creative director or a project director, are quite similar. I think that the difference with a with a creative director though is that your focus is is on making a great product, is is in making great output in in something that really inspires people to kind of want to get involved or want to go and see that show or want to to kind of be part of it and i kind of we had a really interesting um go see yesterday with um sarah coop who's the um executive director of the lumiere festival so that's the big lights festival that ha happens in durham every two years and it's happened in london and and she she's a, a, an amazing fundraiser and and kind of and also kind of you know a practice project manager but she kind of sees her role as kind of creating the or, or gaining the funding to allow her creative director to do amazing things and I think there's something in being a project director which is you know to facilitate a really efficient and well-run project so that your kind of creative director can really focus on your output and what you do and kind of inspiring an audience or getting an audience involved so I'm not sure if that really answers the question but I think there's, there's real similarities between both jobs and I think there's some some key differences as well. Yeah, I, th I think it, it answers it in a way that probably wasn't expected. But yeah, that, that, has, <laughs> that has answered the question. Um, we're now in a position where we're like on to more open questions. So I'm going to dive direct the next two, but actually feel free anyone to, to answer these because I think they do really relate to all of you in your current careers. Um, the first one, which... It's quite length, lengthy, so uh, apologies for listening to me for too long. Um, thinking of the young British artists' attack to creating successful career paths, would you say working alone or forming a collaboration or collective would work when applying for a creative post? What are the benefits and disadvantages? Now, obviously, Brennan and Birch are a collaborative. We've got Bluer Skies here, and I know, Georgia, you also have a collaborative partner that you work with. Um, so what are the benefits and disadvantages of, of being in those situations or those working environments? Shall I go? Um, I think architecture generally is all about collaboration. At a university, it's a little bit, it can feel a bit competitive because everybody works in silos, but in actual practice, we are also dependent on multi like multiple disciplines, engineers, um, landscape architects, things like that. So um, we both bring different skills to the table. Um, and I think that's really important. You can't know everything when it comes to architecture or design in that aspect. So Zach, who I work with, he's 
far more technical than I am. He loves getting into detailing things, whereas I quite like the high level logistics side of design. So I think that can go quite nicely together when we're working on projects. Yeah, I'd just uh, say, agree with what George is saying. With Blue Skies, um, you know, Charlotte and I, we both have sort of different skill sets and different uh, past experiences and things, but they do, they work well together. We complement each other and then we're able to, we're just having that other person to bounce ideas around with. I mean, just, it's, it's so good because otherwise it's just going around in, in your own head and it's like, how do I get this out? And and for me, I suppose it gives us confidence to put it out as well. Um, but uh, but yeah, I definitely enjoy having that relationship with somebody and, and also someone that will say, that's great or that's really not that good. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's relook at this, you know. So um, I really value that. And um, uh, yeah, and it's just a really enjoyable learning curve so far. So yeah, that's my experience so far. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can just say a little bit because um, like, I've worked in kind of both different ways. Like, I have a company which is a public arts company um, called Common Ground with someone called Nikki Kane who's done like uh, a few public commissions. We used to do residencies and that's kind of great in a sense uh, and also in a sense that we also had to be a different type of legal body to be able to take on certain funding and we needed we needed to work together as a team to be able to to get those bigger opportunities um, but also like um, and we work together well on those types of projects but there is some projects where collaborations haven't been so successful uh, for me and like working but then that sort of the, I mean as a collective whereas like um, I, I've directed sort of artworks that are more like theatre plays working with musicians and actors and that's what I like to do more now and that is a collaboration, but we're not a collective. So we're not like, we, know, we, we kind of know our own roles, if that makes sense. Um, and we work together, we, use, we bounce off each other's skills. Uh, but there's, yeah, there's different dynamics that you can take, I think that work really well. And yeah, finding like good people that you enjoy and you can have fun, but also do something really creative is like really important. But that can also be through open calls and, and connecting. Uh, in that way, like with auditions and stuff with actors and stuff. Mm -hmm. I would say um, for us guys, I mean, a lot of people have kind of said, you know, they've been jealous of the fact that we've got each other because as artists, they found it quite a lonely time. So in terms of working together, it's very supportive being in either a partnership or a collaboration. But I think one thing to bear in mind is if you go for jobs, for example, as the two of you, making sure that you do cost both of your time because there is a danger for people to see it as, one person doing all the work and just bear that in mind if you're going for things cost cost it as both of you because you may both have to be involved in all the meetings and all the project admin etc so just keep that in the back of your mind and also um the partnership's good for me and Madge because I'm the create I'm very creative and I'm really focused about anything creative and I'm not so focused about the business side so Madge does a lot of the business side and I do all the creative side and I'm quite a shy introvert person, but Madge is more outgoing. So she'll shout about us more than I will. Or So if it wasn't for her, I don't think I'd have been pushed out as much as um, we are now because I like to be sort of a bit Banksy and no one know who I am. So it's took me a long time to sort of show my face. And if I didn't have the, the, relationship, the relationship I've got with Madge, because we've been best friends since we were like 13, or something like now, I, I think that I would have found it quite difficult to be a creative person out there. I probably would have just been in my bedroom doing a bit of drawing and I might have had Facebook or something. But um, so it's been quite valuable for us. And hopefully I match benefits from me as well in some way. Definitely. And also the yay mate stuff with with Kirsty and Charlotte from Blue Skies and with Natalie and the fact that we've been getting involved with um the local artist network that's been beneficial to us as well so larger groups um coming together sharing knowledge sharing experience sharing connections and also broadening your reach through um larger collectives i think is interesting as well so 
So mo moving on from the question of um, everyone doing things together, which overwhelmingly sounds like a great idea. Um, this is a very open question to everyone because obviously you're all from different um, career avenues. Who has found their career choice to be very competitive? And I, I think it would probably be helpful to have some tips to overcome that as well. Maybe some personal emotive tips as well as um, actual like functional tips. So please, this is an open audience. If anyone's felt their job is um, quite difficult to get into. I mean, I don't mind going first. I'm a, I'm a COVID graduate, you know, like I graduated in a time where it, no one really kind of knew, knew what was going to happen tomorrow, let alone kind of hiring uh, graduates. Um, so for me, I would say, you know, if, if, if you are worried about kind of competitive, it goes back to what we were saying before about doing your research and being passionate. And like Hannah said, taking every opportunity that you can while you're in university, you know, I've got work experience in things that have kind of nothing really directly to do with teaching you know I've um I've been I've worked at London Fashion Week I've worked in a, a photography studio you know all these little things but actually when you think about your experiences you can adapt that and mold that to kind of what uh, what you want to do nothing is ever useless or, or a waste of time and um, so I would say if you think about competitiveness like now in the current climate just be passionate I think being passionate and showing that you're confident and love what you do, that's going to make you stand out. So take every opportunity and kind of that, that makes that worry kind of less, maybe. I hope everyone agrees. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could second that. I mean, having experience, I'd say, is, is so, so important. You know, I've, I've applied for jobs on LinkedIn that, you know, most of them are above like you know it says uh, it's like 700 applicants or 650 applicants you know like if that's not competitive you know i don't know what is so by you know going back to what we were saying about doing your research uh you know knowing who you're going to speak with and yeah all, all, all those sort of things that you know just to make yourself stand out as much like, like as many courses that you can do you know even if you know, if there's something that you do as a, as a hobby that you think, oh, you know, it's not really to do with my career, but I could kind of fit it in, definitely put it in because you can always use that to, you know, put a spin on what you know. You might be interviewed with someone, and they coincidentally have the similar hobby to one that you weren't going to speak about, and you know, you can really gel with that person. So yeah, similar to that, I was actually at an interview, and I was asked. Other than architecture, what else do you do? What do you do in your spare time? And um, I've always this was this was years ago, but I always think back to that that I always try and make sure I prioritise my personal life and what I want to be doing that isn't necessarily linked to my career and my job, but what makes me happy. And that really does come through in an interview that. And you'll you'll stand out from others if if you're confident in who you are, then they'll, they'll pick up on that. Mm. I think um, from a kind of artist, kind of photographer, where you're making stuff you love and being on social media a lot, you can easily compare yourself to everything that you see and the number of likes people get in, and if that is kind of Dull with, dull, dulling your inspiration and your creativity just get off of there for a day just just and 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 realize that if you're feeling these feelings the people on the other side of those likes and the other person that's posting that you're comparing yourself to are feeling these feelings like the top people that I aspire to um I hang out a lot on clubhouse and they just talk so down to earth the man that I've put on a pedestal as like my creative inspiration when COVID hit lost all his revenue streams all his income and he is this you know and he's like questioning his creativity questioning his like 20 year career questioning like how is he gonna put food on his table for the next week um and if I didn't have that kind of conversation on clubhouse um like you just you just go oh yeah they're just they're just like me they feel all these insecurities and this fear and this kind of what am I doing with my life question just as much as me 
And because they get a million likes and I get 10, it doesn't make them any different. And they're fighting the same battles daily that you are. And so it's just, again, going back to confidence and making sure you're doing it for the right reason. And it's, you're, you're on the right, you're doing okay. You're, do, you're, you're doing okay is, is what I can say to anyone that's like really questioning whether to take art as a subject. Like if it's something that you would spend hours doing, that's a good enough reason. Go on, mate. Come, Reese. I was. <laughs> Zoom call life. Who's talking next? Yeah. <laughs> Let's go over to Reese, and then we'll go to Madge. No, sorry. I think I think I must have touched my mic. I, I wasn't. I wasn't here. Yeah. Oh, okay. We'll go straight to Madge. <laughs> um, I was just going to touch on branding. So when me and Lisa started out, um, one of the main products we did was T-shirts. So obviously that's incredibly competitive and it's something that if you want to stand out, you really have to have a really strong brand. You have to think about the very small things like packaging or the labels. Um, you have to have a point of difference. So if you are in something highly competitive, you need to really build your brand and you need, you need to work out your own identity and make yourself stand out. So it isn't a problem if something's highly competitive, but you do need to have a really strong look if you want to go into that industry. And I think it is about being open to to things being competitive because it just is, you know, like, like to go into any of these kind of roles or these industries is competitive. But the 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 thing that I've learned most is that actually when things don't go quite right or you do get rejected, you still learn a huge amount from that. You know, you still often it's from those rejections or, or from something not quite working out. You, you'll meet someone you know, who, who might give you a break or you'll find something else, you know, like that, the thing that you absolutely wanted, you wanted more than anything, you put huge amount of hours or I put huge amount of hours into. And then through going through that process, I found something else that, you know, that I didn't put as much pressure on, but then I got that opportunity and that was the opportunity that I really should have got, you know? So, so what I've kind of learned to do is, is see it all as a learning experience and not put too much pressure on it that whether it's going through an interview or, or applying or putting a proposal in, it's kind of like, well, how can I go along and show myself in the kind of best way that I can and build, you know, a good rapport with the people that I'm meeting or the people that I'm speaking to and just enjoy that moment. It's always going to be scary, but I'm going to learn something from, from preparing for that. You know, I'm going to learn something from meeting these people. Then afterwards, I go and do something nice like go to the cinema you know and just kind of chill out from it but you know like you, you've got to kind of manage that expectation because it, it's kind of building your life around a, a perceived opportunity you know is going to break you so many times because if you just see it as a small thing an opportunity to meet some people and apply for something it takes the pressure off and you're always going to learn from it the amount of people that i've seen come forward to these let's create sessions that we've run we've had some artists and creatives talking about what they've done and they've just done it by you know when, when something hasn't quite gone right or they've been rejected actually there's a link there's a partnership there's a there's a network that they've found through doing that so i think it's just being open that it is going to be competitive it is going to be difficult but that that's how you learn. That's how you make it happen is through it being difficult. You know, if you kind of just walk into anything, you're never going to learn. You know, you need it to be tough. That's how you get good. Linking from James's point as well, if something is unsuccessful and you don't kind of get the outcome that you wish, ask that company, in my case, ask that school, why you weren't successful, because actually sometimes they can give you an insight into kind of what you were missing or what they wanted and that can kind of lead you on to the next interview okay I didn't I wasn't you know passionate enough maybe I'll take that into my next interview so like basically echoing Jane's point you know ask ask for that critique and ask ask for that feedback because it actually can help you in the future I'm going to move on to the next next question um we've got two questions left and the last one is going to be one that will probably antagonise everyone. Um, this one shouldn't, though. Um, the question is, what's different trying to enter creative industries 10 years ago to now? And how do you see the future of the creative industries? Again, this is open to everyone. I know that Hannah touched on some AI stuff earlier. Uh, perhaps we could start there again. So I, I personally think that's a really interesting perspective. Um, okay, so my facts come from the Economic Forum report, which is a, which are a group of people that kind of look at data from all over the world and put it in this kind of 
nice digestible report and um they're saying in the next five years the top either that, in the top five skills is like analytical thinking problem solving creativity and I can't remember the other two uh, <laughs> um and you know like when I I I I was looking at that to put statistics in my pitch for Haven Changing for um James down there and um I was like why has no one ever told me this? Like, why, why have I spent as a, as a pre, I don't know, uh, before COVID, I spent three years kind of lost, so totally lost, um, doing freelance photography, but kind of hating every moment of it. And I just was questioning like, why, why can't, like, why aren't I enjoying this? Like what, this is like something that I've worked out for the next, last 10 years of my life. Like, why isn't it working? And then, so I kind of lost all the value in my creativity and I just thought it didn't work in this society. Um, and then I come across these like factual scientific, you know, evidence-based research. And I'm like, why aren't people telling me that I could actually be like one of the highest paid people in a company? Like every kind of business that's the best out there is because they bring something unique and that uniqueness only comes from someone's creativity of seeing a gap um which if I heard that when I was in late like in my A-level years I would have gone okay let's let's you know let's do this I can see myself in this industry I know how to get paid for it now like um yeah so maybe with the increase of robots and artificial intelligence the place that we're gonna stand out in is bringing unique ideas instead of like a, a repetitive churning of output that robots can do it's trying to find that new kind of space with our creativity um and that's you know the top businesses in the world Walt Disney he was the biggest creative ever and you know that's how he got to where he was because he stood by this kind of world of imagination and if anyone goes, yeah, but you're creative and you're not going to be successful, just be like, oh yeah, look, Walt Disney, this crazy guy, and he's like the biggest success in the world. Like, use him as an example to prove, you know, what you can offer to the world. Yeah, I've just gone around it. So. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyone else? Well, I mean, you know, creativity, you know, is something, you know, that's what makes you unique. That's like your if you are creative you know that's your unique selling point you know so you know i've had it before you know you're in a in a corporate session you, know, you can be in a business meeting with these people that you know are much higher than you and it's really hard to get them to listen and value your opinion you know if you're the apprentice or you know why is you know the ceo or the managing director you know why are they going to listen to your your idea but if you you know if you can show that you're creative and you maybe you think in a way that they don't think uh, that's a great way to get people to listen to you um so yeah that i mean that's probably one of the best things about you know being creative it's not a lot of people are creative or don't think in that way naturally so if you can show that and show that you think on a different level then that's that they that's the value they see at the end of the day you know as an employee you get paid for the value that people see in you can i have a go um so the 10 year thing about like coming into like uh like graduating now or, or going into roles now like for me i i think um i see a lot of fair more, more fairer practice actually around the way people are getting paid the way that they're treating people that want to come into different industries like internships and things like that and and i think that's really positive and more sort of democratic ways of working um and like people being given more agency and more sort of more of a chance to sort of see what they can do and i i really think that's a, a positive shift that i've seen uh happen but i think yeah you know there's only sort of getting better like set set um like a lot of opportunities following uh like uh minimum pay sort of things for artists like that being set by the arts council I know what's it called, like the, um, 
the unions, sorry, like these sort of arts unions and things like that, especially in Scotland, they had a big influence on that. So yeah, I think those things are really cool. Like, I think it's actually, yeah, it's getting kind of more like nice. If there's any bad bits, they, they, they seem to be getting nicer in my opinion. I graduated about 10 years ago. Um, my BA Honours Fine Art from Havering College. And when I graduated, um, there was a, a, a big controversy about how much money the Arts Council was using for um, their um, recreation uh, budget. And uh, it, sort of, it saw lots and lots of cuts in their funding. And I think uh, over the last 10 years, the arts has suffered. I know um, uh, Havering College as well, like the, the offer that they had there has been cut. So uh, I think over the last 10 years, it has seen a cut, but I think now there's this kind of like, um, the people have realized that there is this value of creativity and they've realized that actually um, we've seen a drop in it because there hasn't been as much funding and uh, the world can become a duller place. And so I think now, especially with COVID, um, the emphasis is on well-being and it's on being creative and being, you know, trying to overcome these issues that we all have with COVID and being able to kind of work around these things and finding creative solutions to things. And I think that, uh, you know, hopefully I see a good future for us. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's a better time than 10 years ago. I think every 10 years there, there's something to, you know something to be scared of or something new to learn but I think always artists and creatives are the first to adapt to 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 kind of those changes you know like to, to be in, in those roles or to, to be in this kind of industry you kind of have to ad adapt to what audiences want and we're inquisitive we like trying new things we like trying new technology you know I think to, to be an artist or a creative you've got to try new things I always think about Hockney you kind of you know create from canvas to Polaroid to iPad you know was always kind of you know if, if you can create if in one sphere you, you very easily pick up a technology that makes it easier for you to be creative in another sphere so I think it's it's, it's you don't need to, to fear that and I think also with we're lucky in where we're based as well in that we've got London on our doorstep or we are London, you know, like we're kind of world leading in so many different kind of creative industries and there's so many opportunities, you know, there's going to be a film studio in Dagnum in the next kind of five to 10 years, you know, which is going to open up a huge amount of opportunities. So I just think that, you know, like it is scary when you're coming out of, of, of college or university and you think, oh, I'm, I'm going to have to learn and adapt to kind of this big change or there's not going to be as many opportunities. But there's always opportunities for artists and creators because people love it. It's, it's the re a reason for living, isn't it? To get, get to go and see something interesting or inspiring or amazing. So there's always going to be an audience. It's just kind of adapting to what that new technology is. And I think being a creative, you're, you're normally the first person on the scene to do that. I actually have um, have an opinion on this as well, which is that, yeah, to echo what Bobby was saying about, um, you know, actually it's a nicer place to work in creative industries at the moment. I, I really feel that. And actually it's very nurturing as well. I think with the change from the Arts Council in terms of creative people and places funding, as an example, you know, there is a shift towards people wanting to take care of people with the arts there's a lot more community funding that is kind of anchored towards the arts. Um, and there's lots of companies that are seeing the potential of creativity as well. I mean, coming from commercial practice, actually cultural um, events instead of promotional events are way more effective in creating better customers, you know, getting better sense of belonging inside a shopping center, like all of these things. Uh, kind of being discovered on a commercial level and that wouldn't be done unless there was like this really caring nurturing feeling around the arts at the moment I, I think it's very easy to say that oh it was horrific 10 years ago and it's great now or you know it was much better 10 years ago and it's horrific now I think it is just like a an environment of change isn't it you know there are some things that were better 10 years ago there was more money in the arts from government however now there is probably more money going into the arts from um, commercial developers there's things like section 106 funding that is kind of aimed towards social value that's legal policy now and you know I think as an artist or a creative 
and being in the creative industries it's almost our job to lobby for all of those changes to constantly happen so we can constantly put ourselves in a much better position in the future sorry that's my speech over um and we're going to our last question so i don't know if anyone remembers um i think it was in the daily mail there was a lovely article about the top 100 jobs and the most or the least useful jobs that um you might have and actually one of the least important jobs listed in the daily mail was being an artist um so to end our uh, symposium i'm just going to say discuss I would just say that if you had to spend the last year without utilising any work from any artists, you'd probably be looking at a grey wall throughout the whole of lockdown. You wouldn't even be able to use a computer, most likely. Yeah, there was probably a creative person. You wouldn't even be able to use Zoom. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't have been asked to do anything. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say. It'd be a very dull life. <laughs> I, think I agree with Hannah really like the word artist I mean the first thing that comes to people is like someone with a paintbrush but actually the word artist means so much more and I think brushing part of the pun brushing everyone with the same brush isn't 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 kind of the right thing to do and I think like Hannah said it's so broad now you know an artist is so many things it's you know how can you just say that's like that, that's the least thing because it, it's actually everything you know everything we're wearing has been designed and it's everything. Yeah, I feel like whoever, you know, whoever said that obviously, you know, doesn't understand the meaning behind artists. And as you say, you guys, like an artist is not, you know, it's not someone that's sitting outside the shops, you know, painting a, a scenery, you know, everyone watches Netflix, everyone watches YouTube, you know, art, you know, you can see filmmaking is an art, you know, graphic design and how you see and play, you know, people playing, you know, video games, and oh, they've been designed, you need graphic designers, you need artists, so it's in everything. So to say it's the least important thing, yeah, it's clearly by an, an uneducated person. <laughs> it even goes through to what you're interacting with, your, your home, and what you're sitting on in order to watch television, and, you know, the cars we drive, and the reason why you're able to carry a bag from the supermarket, and all these things it's just ridiculous but everything has been designed by someone so what is left really it's like the layout of your own house is designed the reason why it's so convenient the way you move around your kitchen is is designed in a way to make it convenient for you so yeah it's quite an ignorant statement to make Natalie's just grinning <laughs> I'm really this enjoying the anger <laughs> There's something in it, though, about the perception of artists and, and where and how, you know, and in how certain people, certain, yeah, certain people think about artists. And I think there's something about class there. And I think there's something about the perception of high arts. And I think there's something about the perception of institutions shutting people out, you know. And I think, you know, like, if it is that, then, yeah, we have had enough of that. We've had enough of institutions and artists and art only being for people that have got money or about kind of a history that we've got no involvement with, you know. But actually what we're talking about is, is art being for everyone and creativity being for everyone and kind of, you know, creative jobs and creative roles being rewarded did well with fair pay you know and uh, everyone's got an opportunity no matter what background they've got to be involved in a, a creative role and a creative job and that's that's fine I'm, I'm pleased that high art and kind of the, the perception of an artist which is usually a man you know kind of is is kind of is being derided because it should be because it was wrong and hopefully we're, we're starting to see that change you know and to actually you know it's kind of in the arts council strategy it's called let's create now you know it's not talking about arts and culture is this highfalutin thing anymore it's talking about everyone you know and I think I think we you know us as a kind of as a as a country and as a place are starting to, to value creativity more and more but not the type of creativity that sits in a gallery that no one cares about apart from rich people I would definitely agree with that and like you can see that through uh, Grace and Perry's art club is like, such a good example I mean someone else mentioned it and it's like yeah he's kind of it's a bit of an idol from Essex you know and um, yeah there's just kind of 
yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to say, just to iterate that I agree. And uh, let's uh, hopefully more people can feel comfortable with whatever way they want to be creative and, and that will be, yeah, be able to be funded better and it would be part of more things. So I hope that, yeah, that more people do decide to take creative uh, subjects because, yeah, yeah, I think it's really important just to sort of to keep an open mind. And uh, I think it um it mirrors how so like society is like a very linear linear oh gosh words straight line thinking and that um. You know, if you're an artist, you're only your outcome of paintings. Where reality is that we need way more across the board thinking. Where how all our brains think, we kind of have this idea, and then we spread out and we think of all these different avenues. And I think it also it mirrors how kind of education is taught. So we get pushed into the one right answers. Like there's one way to write a good story. You know, beginning, middle, and end. Um, there's one way to there's like 20 um options of film kind of um storylines like everything is kind of brought back into this structure and what we're seeing now is way more kind of less linear linear thinking and more kind of where there's no right answer but we're still making progress and as artists that that's what we do great that's you know that is our way of life almost there's no right way to be um and i think we're, we're slowly seeing a shift in thinking like in kind of like microchasms um and what i'd really love is that the education kind of starts to reflect this need to be as a skill of creativity seeing that being like really high up and instead of just teaching about oh two plus two is four, but actually like you could do one plus one plus one plus one to get the same answer. Um, it, you know, just kind of like this shift in thinking that's not so kind of yes or no, but lets its students be able to explore multiple possibilities that actually one might be even better than the right one. Um, so this idea of an artist is like that linear linear thinking of you could produce painting where actually we need a bit more of a bigger framework to kind of move about in and I really hope that we see this shift kind of be bigger in kind of mainstream society. <laughs> that was quite big. <laughs> but yeah go ahead Lisa. <laughs> so yeah um I think you know, everybody's different um, and we all have different ways of communicating our ideas. That might be through music, it might be through film, it might be through poetry or whatever. And uh, I think art and making art is just another platform, a, a way of being able to discuss um, what you are trying to say as an individual. And that discussion might be personal. It might be um, about something that's happened in your personal life. It might be something political. It might be discussing general issues that are happening at the moment. And I think it's just another platform to be able to, to do that. And uh, so, yeah, I think it is valid uh, being an artist as such. Um, it's not sitting there just painting a painting. It's many things. So yeah, he's wrong. <laughs> <Daily man's> wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to go back to um, like the educational side of things. I mean, where where I work, it's an independent school, and um, and I'd say even in there, there is an element of where um, they see the value in art, but yet yeah, other subjects still take a higher precedence. Um, but fortunately, we've got a whole change of sort of leadership really there now that I think seems to come from much more of a creative. Um, spirit and is seeing sort of the values and the benefits that art brings into everything and I think like what we've all said is that you know you wouldn't have anything without art you know if it wasn't there you know you just wouldn't yeah as everybody said you just wouldn't have these opportunities that we do have and and it is about sort of opening people's eyes to realizing that that's where it came from I think because we've everything 
is kind of designed and ordered for us um, that, you know, there's a lot of people that don't think about where things come from. And we have to point out, I mean, this is the Daily Mail that has you know, made this top 100 list. But obviously a lot of people do read that. But I'm just really thankful that we're, you know, well, that we're in this position and that there are a lot more. And I think coming out of um, COVID or coming out of lockdown, that one of the benefits actually has perhaps highlighted how important the creative um, industries are to our well-being. And if that's a route that's going to make it bigger for everybody to recognise, then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, and uh, I just think that, well, the future can only get better, really. And, um, you know, and hopefully in the next 10 years, that spot of 100 will be much, much higher up the list. So. I really like the ending on a really optimistic note. And, you know, I, I think everyone kind of shares the idea that creativity should be valued at a really, really high level. And um, I hope that the students that do watch this can gain a, a really good amount of inspiration from everyone that's taken part today because you know everyone's speaking from a very different perspective a very different uh, career path a very different uh, place in your career path as well but everyone brings their own story and their own influence and inspiration of um, why creativity is important and why it's not something that you should give up on and I think you know George's speech about art, art being everything it's it's so true you know just look around you like try and find something that hasn't been purposely designed for life and then kind of re-establish how important and how valuable creative industries are um, so I'm gonna finish the live recording now and say a huge thank you to everyone that's taken part today um, we've, we've really appreciated it um, from the organising team and hope you've got a little bit from it as well even if it's a little bit of networking for the evening